I'm going to wind back genetically as here's what we know. Back about 1950, you can actually go back in records in New Jersey back to 1915 where they have records of weeping hemlocks coming in from Japan that they say had adelgids on them in New Jersey. Okay, there's notes on that. Now, what happens a lot of times is those never took. You know what I mean? Is it was almost like a disease like AIDS or something where you know it took several times before somebody came over and then bam, it really took. So what happened, we can trace most of this back to a nursery in Richmond, Virginia in 1950. They got a big shipment of weeping hemlocks that came in and they also had a lot of Easterns and Carolina hemlocks. So the adelgids jumped off of those trees onto our native trees no host acceptance problem at all. They don't like Carolinas as much as Easterns because Carolinas are related to Chinese hemlock. Carolina and Chinese hemlock can never breed, so they're actually remnant species. What happened, of course, was the classic thing that happens with a lot of these invasives where people said, this is not going to become a problem. The U.S. Department of Defense told the Azorians that the Japanese beetle would never be a problem in the Azores. Right? So what happened? Now, 80 to 90 percent of the hemlocks in Shenandoah are dead. Right? So, I started in this program in 1999 with Fred Hain. Fred is great. He is a great guy. His background is in genetics. I worked for five years in Christmas tree production. But I had experience with adelgids because in the Fraser fir world, the biggest number one pest is balsam woolly adelgid. There's twig aphids and some other things too. Long story short, we did farmscaping in Christmas trees and showed it worked just as good as, in, it actually works better than vegetables. The other thing I could do is I could go to some of these conventional guys and they'd say, well, I really want to chemically mow and I want to throw osmocote out. And I said, well, back off three years from your harvest date. And if you clean your trees up and you go three years, you can be certified organic and get a better price. So suddenly, even though that was kind of like cheating, all of a sudden they were getting a little bit more money and then they were starting to think about doing organic stuff and I might even put some yarrow out in my scene. You put yarrow out in that field. Well, you know, it's real easy to do yarrow. You just go over and get the seed heads and shake them in a Ziploc bag and then go put them out, right? So I had familiarity with that. We started working in this thing with Fred Hain and those guys, and the very first insect they got was this darn sasaji, and it's the worst thing you could have done because that's a summer predator. It doesn't even come out until right now or maybe a little bit later. The whole crux with hemlocks is when the leaves fall in autumn, those trees turn on, and they start storing photosynthate. They store photosynthate from now till about a month from now when the leaves come out, they're done. It doesn't matter if they're sitting under three layers of shade in the summer, because during the winter they got all the sun that they wanted. So the critical thing that we found was our threshold, right? One of your questions to think about when you're talking about this, what's a threshold? So the threshold for hemlocks, when 30% of the needles or less are infested, the tree grows normally. It actually goes better than normal. It grows like it's stimulated. Why are western hemlocks a third bigger than eastern hemlocks. I think it's because they have adelgids and beetles and that's the only difference. All the churches back around the 1900s used eastern hemlock as a symbol of everlasting life. So if you go to the University of Washington, the next giant city block that's 10 square blocks is Calvary Church. They have 18 eastern hemlocks in there that were planted in 1900 the one that we measured was nine foot six inch DBH. You know, they're getting as big as the Westerns out there because they're sitting in an environment where they have the organisms that stimulate them in that balance. If you're trying to solve a problem, you need to be properly trained. It doesn't matter if you have a degree like I do, but when you do this stuff, first of all, it happens with proper idea of the pest. So what happened with us, we didn't get proper idea of the pest first off. Yes, this pest came to us from Japan, but guess what? This pest was part of our own country and we didn't know it. So we went way off into la-la land for 20 years until 2006, okay? I spent a lot of time doing this. I'm just telling you this. If, if you're going to call out the Avengers, you know what I mean, you need all this kind of experience. 
We need our organic biodynamic experts like this, and it takes time, and we have to school people and bring them up and bring them up through organics, because you think what I went through, half of my career I spent arguing with people about the fact that organics would work. If I could get that time back and we didn't have to argue about it, we could have been a lot further down the road, but we were in that transition period. One other little important point that was on there, two-thirds of the eastern hemlock forest is on private land. Two-thirds of the forest in the West is on government land. All the Forest Service guys are trained mostly out West, and then they come back here. So they think their only problem is on their land. I don't like to think with boundaries, OK, because the bugs don't see it. This is that important point that I told you before, is once you have less than a third of these needles infested, these things, and they grow it better. This is why these western hemlines, this is what I believe anyway, and I'm not going to live to see this, but somebody is. Proper identification of the pest is number one. When you guys are thinking about anything to do biologically, and you tell me you've got a greenhouse whitefly, and it's actually silverleaf whitefly, and you're going to put out an incarcia, you ain't going to control it. So you've got to have that. Even though this pest is native to Asia, this is the big point that I've been trying to make for the last 10 years, and powers that be are very resistant. If they will admit that this adelgid is native to our own country, then that means that the controls for this adelgid are also in our own country. If my farmscaping stuff's going to work, I'm going to have to use it on trees. So if I'm thinking about what am I going to use on trees, what starts to happen is I start to think of the other adelgids and where they are. So if I'm thinking of hemlocks, I'm also thinking of pines, I'm thinking of spruces, I'm thinking of firs, and I'm thinking of larches because all those trees get adelgids, and they all grow together in the forest. Oh, isn't that amazing? So a lot of these beetles move between adelgids. The summer predators are very active movers, okay? So I call it forestscaping. Adelgids are a woolly aphid, okay? Apple trees have a woolly apple aphid. These things will eat woolly apple aphids. They'll eat the red aphids. They'll eat rosy apple aphid because they have quinones in them. So things that are really close, you know what I mean, is I'm sitting here and I'm looking out in the, in the landscape now and I'm learning how to read the landscape. And when I first got there, I couldn't read anything. Now I can sit there and I can go. Let's say I'm looking in Old Tacoma Cemetery, you know, one of these big old cemeteries. It's got sequoias in it this big. There's big hemlocks in there. There's ornamental plums. I mean, this place is just full of indulgent food. So there's beetles in these places all over the thing. Now, once again, I'm just going to keep going through this because we've got to beat this into people's heads. Prior to 2006, here's what we thought. There was no effective natural enemies. And I went to all these meetings that were the most gloomy meetings you can possibly imagine. Back around the early 2000s when all the trees are dying, my trees are dying, my biggest hemlock dies. This is an article that threw everybody off. And I'm not going to pick on Dr. McClure that wrote this article. He was well-meaning. This is a 1992 American Nurseryman article. He went to 42 sites in Seattle that he visited. <clears throat> there are no effective natural enemies. His study went from April to September, okay? That beetle back there comes out in October, and it's usually gone by April out there, right? They totally missed the absolute most important predator of the system. Totally missed it. This article threw everybody off. Everybody used this article back when I was there, and they were going, well, McClure says there's none. And I'm like, well, <laughs> I'm out there, and I'm finding them, right? So, you know, I'm from Missouri, so I love my old Mark Twain quotes. It's ain't what you know, right? It's what you think. So if you think about this, here's the big game changer for us. In 2006, the adelgid was found to be native. This is your... Um, Western Hemlock Range. It goes all the way down into the four uh, northern counties of California. This is like Arcata, kind of in that area, okay? These are where this Laracobius beetle is, and we're going to move them from around the Puget Sound to North Carolina. And this became a big game changer for us. So 2006 happens, and this pest is native Nathan Havel has published a paper on this. It has extremely effective natural enemies. It has a specific winter predator, and it's got a whole guild. It's got silver fly. Everybody now is working on all these summer things. 
that are way less of a importance. Okay, so you got people arguing about silver flies, you got people arguing about society, you got me arguing about skimness, and I don't really care which. One, if any of them work, that's great. Here's the other thing that I began to see because I'm going out to Seattle a lot. I'm talking to these arborists, and I'm like, suddenly I realize I'm like, hey, where are the eastern hemlocks? You want to see some? Come here. We go to the arboretum. We go to Washington Park Arboretum, right across from the university. There happens to be this row of hemlocks. The big trees are about 50 feet tall. Every other one of them is eastern, western, eastern, western. <laughs> this is where it really gets great because all the adelgids on both of these trees are tracking identical. When there's an adelgid outbreak on the western, there's an adelgid outbreak on the eastern. When the kibosh happens and we would take samples where we're showing we're getting 97% predation, we're getting 97% predation on the Easterns and we're getting 97% predation on the Westerns. The other interesting things that people are doing right about this time is they're doing something called caged exclusion studies. So they're taking hemlocks that are infested in adelgids, they're building a cage to keep the predators out of them. The Western hemlocks died as fast as the Eastern hemlocks. There's no genetic resistance that I know of in these trees. It's simply predator-prey relationships, okay? So when I look at this thing, this is really bad because when you see this ovisac here, look at all these ovis. These little, every one of these little, little dot, these little globes is an adelgid, okay? The other thing that I notice when I see this is none of these ovisacs are all torn up. When I show you the stuff that I got, it looks like toilet paper on Halloween in a tree. It's just ripped to shreds. And then the next thing that seals the deal that we'll talk about in a little bit is ultraviolet light. Because if you shine ultraviolet light on this, your predator poop glows orange. Your egg damage glows yellow. Your adelgid blood, if they spill, because these predators are vampire feeders, they drink blood. The blood of the adelgid is chartreuse, so it's a color of antifreeze, okay? The, uh, the Larry egg is green, so let's look at the colors you've got. And the, and the normal ovisacs like these guys here that would have a little bit of honeydew, they glow blue-white. So you got blue, orange, green, yellow. you got these crazy colors going on. Here's an electron micrograph of an adelgid at the base of the needle. And, you know, each one of these, the, these little dark things are the cast skins. So if you've got one of these, you can count what instar it is by the cast skins that are on it and what size it is. We do that later. This is in 2006. You see the infested area. And of course now, 12 years later, almost all of this is infested. Um, there's outbreaks in Michigan. There's outbreaks up in Canada. When you have exponential growth, the last stage before the whole thing is completely covered is the stage before, right? So you get here and then boom, it just goes fast. This is a couple of years ago, so now it's 20 miles more. F11, let me think what generation we're in now. We're in some from 2003, so we're in about F15, okay? So we have more than 20,000 square miles of just total hemlock regrowth that's nothing but beetles up there all over the place. We discovered this summer predator. I haven't had any luck uh, finding it out in the field, but we've released a lot of it. So it was something else. And the other thing that's really great that you guys will like, and we'll talk about this in a minute, and I'll show it. I'll set it up for you, and we'll do it. We're going to have to go into a dark room. Here's a critical thing. This guy comes out in October, and the, the, the beetles are done within about a month. The only th There's a few males alive now, but most of these are down to these big females that are laying eggs. Um, they're, they're host specific to adelgid. They're synchronized with HWA. They're also synchronized with pine bark adelgid. And, uh, and they live a long time, so, you know. And I found them as late as June 3rd or even later. The first time I went to Seattle, we dissected 1,200 ovisacs. took us a week. 600 of them had an egg or a larvae in them. The other 47% were disturbed. So if you add these with actual physical presence versus the disturbed ovisacs, we got 97% predation rate. The 3% that's left is just enough to keep the adelgid on the tree and it'll start the cycle over again. So what happens is it's almost like locust leaf miner, where you know you look out one year and you know where your locusts are because all the leaf miners are over there and they brown the locust out about late July, early August. Well, the next year, those locusts look fine, 
but the locust leaf miner's on the other side of the valley. And so that's what happens with the adelgid and this beetle is it's just whack-a-mole. They just move around. All right, so here's what's real interesting. I, we may see some of these today. This egg glows a bright, it looks like the moon. It glows a greenish yellow. These guys do not glow unless they've been eaten. If they get bit, the vitelligenin in them glows yellow. So your Larry egg, you can open up these ovisacs. So what we do is we'll dissect ovisacs and we count how many. When this hatches out, it eats 230 to 250 of these eggs. And the females can lay 200 to 400 of these larvae. So it's the larvae that just nuke the adelgid. It really works well. Okay, so here is an ovisac that we dripped alcohol on to dissolve the, the, um, the wool away. Here's your little cute Laracobius larva. It looks like a, you know, it looks like a little alligator. It looks like a ladybug larva. The thing that's really neat about this is when this ovisac is intact, the beetle actually lays its egg inside the ovisac, which is, beetles don't normally do that. You know, beetles are normally ecto. So this thing acts like a parasitic wasp, and then it comes up and lays this guy in there. This guy is going to eat, the, the ovisacs out west have about 150 eggs in them. So this guy's got to go to at least one other ovisac. It has to leave the mother ovisac, the natal ovisac, and go to one other. Where we are here, up where I am in Boone, we have 50 or less eggs. So that means that this larva is going to have to go to at least five and maybe 10 ovisacs. Well, the beetles are really smart. They only lay eggs if there's a row of ovisacs, they'll lay an egg there. Because they, they know they want their larva to be able to complete development. If you have an ovisac that's just sitting way off by itself, they'll either go in there and eat and kill the female or they'll leave it alone. And that one will be the one that will start the whole thing over again and you've got this cool little cycle going on. So you see the size of the trees. Here's a 40-foot pole pruner. There's Mazel. This tree's dead. We didn't, you know, we didn't have, I mean, we're putting out 300 lab-reared beetles. And let me tell you, lab-reared beetles are half as fecund as wild beetles, okay? So when we did this, we had a moderate infestation. It was right at the economic threshold, okay? It was just starting to affect. When you get above this threshold, the photosynthesis on this tree drops to about 5% of normal. So that's, that's, that's our economic threshold. So we put these beetles out in New Year's Day of 2003. The next October, which was hurricanes Fran and Ivan, three days after, a couple weeks after the hurricanes, we found beetles out. And Gina Davis and Stuart Skeet found the first ones. Then we began finding more of them. So, I mean, this, he had 23 release sites, including ours, okay? So we started doing sampling. This is Gina. Gina got her PhD on this, too. She's now the IPM coordinator for the state of Idaho. So what we do is we go out. I've got some, if we have time, we'll go out and pound some conifers and look and see if we can get anything in there. So we were looking at what we found. The other thing we do is we would clip branches and bring those branches back to the lab, like what I've got here is right in this time of year. And then we would look and see what we found. So at first, back in 2006, we didn't find too much. Then suddenly this thing started picking up. And then when it got up to here, that's 100% predation. Because this thing's going to have to go eat the other, you know what I mean? It's not going to get any higher than that. Because it's, it's wipeout time, okay? And at the, this is back when we were, you know, we had to learn all this stuff. So a lot of this was catch up. We were taking the data. And it's like, you know, we had to count eggs and all that. Here's the thing that I started doing too. Not only are we doing this back east, but I'm going back west and I'm studying these limbs. I have eastern hemlock limbs, I've got Carolina hemlock limbs, and I have western limbs. Look at this limb. This is the same limb two different years in a row. This is the exact same limb. I should have flipped it around the other way, the picture. But I have this tag. We counted 486 ovisacs on this, it was, a, it was a meter long piece, okay? I come back the next year, same sample size. Look in here, there's a, you can see maybe one or two, anyway, there's like an adelgid there, and there might be an adelgid in another spot, but it was just enough to start the cycle over again. This thing wiped out 
99% of the, you know what I mean? It went from this to that in one year. We started seeing that wherever we put these beetles out. They would just blow these populations. It, it would take a few years when you've only got a few to begin with. Now, in the natural setting, what happens in Seattle, because these trees are off-site, these trees go into outbreak about every five to seven years. They, they come up and they go back down. They come back up and go back down. In the forest, where we are, once these trees went back into balance, they have never gone out of balance unless it's something like a lightning strike or a flood or drought. Other than that, it's like a top. When it just starts spinning right, and boom, it's back. This is an infrared photo. The red is conifers. So you can, this is banner elk. Here is that old hospital, old spooky hospital. Um, here is Hemlock Hill. There's a duck pond right here. We made releases in two spots because I had just been through Hurricane Fran in Raleigh before I moved up. So these guys are putting release trees along here. And I said, you know what we need to do? We need to go up this mountain and go around. And what we found by accident, all of our beetles were here. Because in the winter, this is a sun tunnel. This area over here is the coldest spot in the whole area right here. It's right below the dam. It's the coldest spot. The beetles moved immediately out of here. We couldn't find them. And they went right into this area. All the hemlocks in this area, even the big old growth ones, are still alive. The ones up here are alive. There's a couple in here that are alive because I put 500 beetles on them. What we started to see happen, this face is south. So all of a sudden the beetles started moving south and they, because they were following the sun. They just kept going, okay? So they just got out and got going, all right? So by 2010, the beetles were a half a mile out in every direction, and we had another release that we made over here, and these two were coming together. It's not just happening where I am. I was hired by the Forest Service. This is when they really started to like me because I was putting out pudding like crazy. So they hired me to do a two-year study up and down the East Coast. Everywhere I went, I found beetles, okay? I'm going to tell you a little story right now. I go get ready to go to Delaware Water Gap to see if they've got beetles there. The head of the program with the Forest Service and three other guys, one of the guys' name is Mark Mayer, he's with New Jersey, went out to six different places, couldn't find anything. That's what they told me. So they called me up two days before I was supposed to come up there and said, you don't need to come up. I'm coming up. I don't believe you. I want one of you guys, pick one of the guys to come and come back and you show me that they're not there. Because they were beetles that I collected and shipped to those guys. So I know on my end they were really good. The first thing we did is we went out, and let me show you something. So I show up with this little crazy umbrella like this and I open it up. And he goes, what are you doing with this? I said, the larvae of the Laracobius are white. If you're using a beet sheet, you can't see them. My very first beet, I get 12 larvae. The head of the program was not an entomologist. That's one of the reasons why I went back and put all that other stuff in there. It's not that I don't care, but if you're going to have a program like this where the health of your forest depends on it, you might want to get people that actually understand the life cycle of this, all right? So not only did we find beetles there, every one of these little dots you see is places that we found. And so Stroudsburg, this is Delaware Water Gap. So the Appalachian Trail goes through here too, okay? If you get up here, you're about 75 miles from New York City going this way. I'm staying, I couldn't find a place to stay in Stroudsburg, so I'm staying way out here. Can't think of the name of the town. There's some hemlocks by a dairy. I go over and pound, they got Laracobias. This is Walnut Creek Park. So I drive over there and there's beetles there. And I did not sample in between here, but this distance from there to there is 35 miles. This distance that way is at least 25 miles. So if you have somebody who knows the natural history and you go out, you can find these things. If you think you can take somebody green who's reading an Appalachian Today magazine and go out and hit this and find it, you're going to be sadly mistaken. You've got to have this. Okay, here's that larva, right? Because it is sitting inside and feeding this ovisac, it gets full of wool. If this is on a white beet sheet, those guys couldn't see it. Not only did every site that we went to have beetles that day, 
I went to two other sites, so we went to eight sites, and every site had beetles. So this is just one of those things where, you know, with a program, you've got to know what you're doing. So now I'm getting my attitude up, so I cold call Grandfather Golf and Country Club, and I get Pete Gurdon. The very first thing Pete says to me, he goes, you're that long-haired boy, aren't you? I say, yes, sir, I am. So this is a diorama that's up at the top of Grandfather, but the point that I wanted to make to you guys was we were running out of time, our trees are dying, where strategically should we go to make these releases is the one place where five river systems start. This is a Precambrian upthrust, Grandfather Mountain, five river systems start here, okay? I got these guys to bankroll me. We put 14,000 beetles out in four years in this area, right here. The first thing that started happening is these beetles blew up. They went up into McCray Meadow. If you go back up over onto Callaway Peak and you come down the backside of Grandfather to about 4,800 feet, eh, somewhere about here, is your uh, hemlock spruce fir line. Right at that line, there's all kinds of Laracobius beetles. In fact, Rusty Ray found them, so he was up there with me. Okay, so yeah, 13,000 plus. Grandfather Mountain is 5,940 feet tall. We needed some good dumb luck. We started getting a little dumb luck because where we were putting these beetles, these beetles, when there was a storm, it would blow these beetles I would go up to Pete and, and he'd say, we had a storm here last night. And I'd say, well, how far do you think the Beatles went? And he said, well, Richard, it's 70 mile an hour wind. You tell me how far they went in an hour. I said, they went 70 miles. And Pete said, boy, you're good at math, right? Because he and I like joust each other back. So the thing that started to happen really quick, I've got the data on this. I'm getting ready to publish this as a very large paper. We consistently saw these Beatles start knocking the adelgids below 30%, and the next thing that started happening is you started to see these big old ragged trees, and they're regrowing. Now, the thing that would happen with some of them, the leader would die. The first thing that would happen on those big trees is this, you know, eight to 10 foot of this leader would die. But then the, there would be enough beetles, and suddenly they would come back in. And you see the trees up where I am now? We've had continuous regrowth since 2009 or 2010. If you come up in our neck of the woods, I've had people call me from over at Tyne Castle and say, you put beetles out up here, didn't you? And I said, well, why would you say that? And they said, because I'm looking out, I know people haven't treated down this valley, and I see all these big hemlocks that are alive. And I was like, you are right. So here's Grandfather. Here's Banner Elk. This was our area in 2012. Okay. By 2008, we have beetles all the way. Look at those numbers, $5 a piece. I had a team of people doing it and I gave a lot of them to the Forest Service. Look what happened. We put 300 beetles in here. It took about three to five years and then suddenly, kawoom, boy, they went. I mean, look at the numbers, okay? So there's that time element. Here's the other thing we started to do. This was in, it was in March two years ago. So this would have been March 2016. I started out over in Sugar Grove. I live right about here. And we went, all of these are positives for the beetle everywhere. Look at all these right in Burnsville, because that's Big Ivy. They made a big release of beetles way back when. So all that area around Burnsville, Mars Hill, uh, all there along Lick Skillet Road. Well, here's Mars Hill. Cashiers got a release. We made got a recovery. That's Roan Mountain. So I'm going to tell you right now, this area, right in here, is all beetles all the time now. So it's really worked. All right. Here's our first five trees along the river, and we started seeing regrowth in July of 2008. One of the interesting things about that is, and here's another thing that happens, is these trees start to grow later because they get outside of the window of the crawlers. I don't know if that's, you know, I don't know how else to say it. 
but they, they're growing later. The crawlers end up being done by about July, the second generation of crawlers. And so these trees that grow into July and August, you'll have, a, you'll have a leader on a tree like this. Well, this much of it has adelgids, then the adelgids stop, and then that thing kept growing, okay? It's kind of hard to see here, but here we are up on grandfather. You've got all these, these are all spruces and firs right at the tree line. That's Sugar Mountain that I'd like to blow up because it's ugly as heck sitting on top of the mountain. This whole area, as far as you can see, there is beetles everywhere, and there's hemlocks regrowing everywhere. So if you turn around, now I'm turning around, I'm facing south. Here's Mount Mitchell. Here's these black mountains. Uh, we've had beetles there. I was just up in, I was just up by Pensacola, up in Murchison, Friday, a week ago Friday. In the Forest Service database, this is where Laracobius releases are made. Everything that you see with a dot are, rele are their recoveries that I entered into their database, okay? So you can get in, they do have a database where you can get in and if the releases have been recorded, they'll pop up on the map. One predator control these. I mean, normally I'll tell you guys, you tell me you're going to depend on one thing, it makes me nervous as can be. It still makes me nervous, but this thing works, and it apparently has been doing this for millions of years, so it seems to be doing pretty good. Remember, once again, this is your economic threshold. Every year, these beetles consume an average of about 97% of dense populations, and these build-up populations, you know, they're, they're in there, but they're not going to put the kibosh on. You get patch dynamics. Um, this is over 20,000 square miles now. And the urban community interface out here, there's a church down the road over there that we, we put some beetles on a hedge on it. This is several years ago. So the urban community interface is actually where we get all these. This is the other thing that confounds the Forest Service is Brad Onkin and Rusty and those guys, we would be out drinking beer and they'd go, are we ever going to be able to collect beetles in the numbers that you're collecting them in the forest? I say, no, buy me another beer. Because there's something, you know what I mean? The edge out here, I'll tell you guys, you go to a cemetery or a school or a UNC Arboretum where you got all those hemlocks over there, you can rack up beetles like crazy. You can have your own, I don't own these beetles. So, really quickly, here's this summer predator. I just want to knock through it real quick. We'll just walk through it real fast. So here's his summer predator. So right as Larry is dropping out of the system right now, out west, there are several summer predators. There's silver flies, there's a skimness, there's pirate bugs, there's a bunch of weird stuff coming out. Look at this hemlock tree. This hemlock tree has got a island around it. When I first found this tree, it was loaded with Laracobius. This is a western hemlock, and this is next to Fort Lawton in Seattle. There was needle duff all the way out, about a foot deep, all the way out to here. Well, this is part of an army base, and I ended up getting arrested for being on the army base, but I don't care about that, because I was in here collecting these guys. Forget it. So they came along with a dozer, and they pulled all this needle duff out and cleaned this all up. Within one year, this tree went from being covered with Laracobius to not having any Laracobius and having all summer predators because Laracobius needs the needle duff. When Laracobius feeds, that larva has to pupate. So once, once that larva gets big, it makes a silk and it silks down and it drops down into this needle duff. And if you don't have this needle duff, you ain't gonna have beetles. So you will not find these beetles commonly up on ridges and stuff. And you're gonna lose a lot of those trees because the trees that are gonna live are gonna be the trees that have the beetles. So the beetles are self-selecting for the trees right now. Just like with, okay, gypsy moth and oak trees in, in the northeast. You've still got oak trees, but the oak trees that used to be up on the ridges up there got defoliated three years in a row, and they're dead and gone. But the ones that are down, you know what I mean? They're slightly off-site. So a tree's going to grow best in its own site. If it starts getting off-site, or, you know, I would say almost any tree that's in Asheville is an off-site tree. You know, it's in an urban environment with air pollution and noise and all kinds of stuff. So that gold beetle, they mainly found it here. I have a permit for it. The other thing that's really important with it are the, are the, that it goes to other hosts. So here is skimness on an eastern pine 
with pine bark adelgid, and it's eaten the adelgids at the bottom of each one of these. Here is loblaw, let me think, this is shore pine, right? um, yeah. That is a skimnus larvae. The reason that larva is there is the ladybugs like pollen. So the ladybugs will lay eggs wherever, whatever conifer is, has pollen on it, they will go lay eggs on that particular one. If it's a pine that's blooming, then you can go to the pine and find them. If it's the lodgepole pine, or you know what I mean, is they just do it on different, different trees. All right. I'm staying in Seattle on Aurora Avenue, and at the time, this is back when I was dependent on the Forest Service, I could only spend $50 a night on a hotel room in Seattle. So I'm staying in places that are starting to scare me. And I read somewhere in one of my entomology journals that ultraviolet light will detect bed bugs, because bed bugs feed on blood and blood glows. So immediately I go, there's this really funny little shop in Seattle called Archie McPhee's. And they moved from Ballard, they're in a new location over by Green Lake, but they got all kinds of quirky stuff. They got plastic big roaches, three feet long. You know, they got all the, your college dorm stuff. So I go and buy a spy pen. And I go back to my hotel room and I kind of wish that I had never bought that spy pen. <laughs> Because the very first thing that I do, you notice on the, on the label here, it says, meet me tonight. And then, of course, I've got it drawn down to a bed bug that I found in my room because of this. I shine the light on the wall, and there's all these glowing blood splatters. And I start following it down, and I follow it down, and there's a plastic baseboard. And I pull that back, and there's a colony of bed bugs. So I take one, and I go down to the manager, and I go, you've got bed bugs. He goes, well, how do you know? How do you know that's a bed bug? I said, I got a PhD in entomology. You want to, you want to mess with me? Because they could do that to the norm. They would do that. And as soon as I leave this place, I'm putting you on bed bug, you know, their bed bug report. Bam. So that scared me to death. And what I started doing was I would go, when I would rent a hotel room, I would take my ultraviolet light, and I knew I would either reject that room or there were places that you needed to stay away from. I'm bored one night, my wife has gone to Raleigh, and when my wife leaves, I become Mad Sigmund, and I do all my crazy science stuff, and I stay up, and I'm doing stuff, so she's gone, and I've got that ultraviolet pen light, and I'm like, hey, I got this little hemlock outside, and it's loaded with Laracobius beetles, and I know it's loaded with Laracobius beetles, so I take this light out, and I shine it, and we're, you guys are going to see this in a bit. This thing lights up like a Christmas tree. And this doesn't even do it justice because these colors are like Kingsford charcoal briquette glowing. So at first, I don't, I don't know what I'm looking at. So I, I, I take a clipping, and there's ovisacs, and the ovisacs are glowing orange. I touch the ovisac with a needle, and a Laracobius larvae jumps out. I go to one that's not glowing, there's no larva. I go to this next one that's glowing, tap on it, another larva pops out. The poop of the predator glows orange because it's eating these adelgids. It's got quinones. Back in the 20s and the 30s, the Germans and the British did all kinds of papers on this because pine bark adelgid came over to Europe then. They called it the American blight. The German chemists and the British chemists took these guys and ground them all down and found out every kind of quinone. And they have tables where they have published which one it is and what color it is. So this is great, because I don't have to do this work. It's all been done. And you know, any, any good discovery like that, it's usually what's been forgotten. There's nothing new except what's been forgotten in a lot of cases. So the other thing that I want you to look at before we go any further this color here is chartreuse. It doesn't show up real good, and I'm taking these pictures with this iPhone camera right here, all right? So this, okay, so when I look at this now, here's what I can tell you what happened. This beetle came along, 
It ate this adelgid here and caused a blood splatter that is chartreuse. It's going a, a green yellow. It came up here. It ate some of the eggs because that's, there's, there's actually really bright glowing if you could see that. Then there's predator poop. It pooped here, it pooped there, pooped here. It ate another adelgid there and the blood splatter went out that way. This is science. This is outside. This isn't even me anymore. This is just physics, okay? Not a lot of people are using this yet, and if you talk to the Forest Service, they would just go, huh? But, but we can use this. This proves beyond a shadow of doubt, first of all, that if you don't have this, then you don't have any predation activity. The neat thing about this this time of year is most of the orange you're seeing is all Laracobes because there's not a, you know, the ladybugs are just now getting out to the trees. The ladybug poop will glow orange too. Surfed poop will glow orange. That is an intact oversack that is glowing blue-white. When I'm lighting this up and I look out, I can see where there's a blood splatter, I can see where there's predator poop, and I can also see, so that, there's a Laracobius larva or somebody's been feeding right there. So you see these other ones that are normal, they kind of glow that blue color. So here's the chartreuse. So here's a lot of blood splatter again. And like I said, these beetles are like vampire feeders, so they bite. What they do is they come in and they bite the neck of the adelgid. It's really interesting because they do a slit. It's really characteristic if you look at it up close. And then the adelgid's bleeding out and they're just drinking the blood. And they may drink it all or they might not. So it's really, you know, makes some nice colors anyways. The eggs glow yellow. So if you think of the colors you've got, you got orange, yellow, blue, and green. It looks just like a Christmas you know, when you go around and you see those LED Christmas lights, I'm like, oh, that looks like predator activity. All right, so here's this. Okay, so I'm doing this study. I got a C in my insect physiology class, and I kept my notes from all the classes that I did bad in because I figured I could do better. So I go back and I look in this thing. Low and, and actually, the, the papers that this guy refers to in dual go back even further. Um, so you can see all these, the different things, these, these colors were recognized. So these are these, and they call them aphids because those were, you know, they come out of an aphid-like creature, and you've got to have the right wavelength of light because the other thing that I did, the next thing I did is I got really excited, and I bought four cheap LED UV lights, and none of them worked because they were not the right wavelength. You've got to be below 400 nanometers and 380 is actually better, okay? Now, and you notice the other thing that I had in, that, in the slide before this one was, was the citation, which I can give Living Web Farms. This is a couple of years ago, so now this is like F14. We haven't found any of this summer predator. Uh, ultraviolet light works great. You can replant areas. You can train people to do this. And then um, we can take this baseline data, and the reason I'm saying an airplane plant is the area up where we are in Boone, we can supply people with beetles. Pretty soon there's going to be beetles that you'll be able to supply here because they've been put out. So the thing that I really like when I can go out in the spring, in my neck of the woods, everywhere, and see this kind of just beautiful growth with these big, nice, long leaders, uh, all over, you get this beautiful flush of growth like this. And so in our area, it's safe to say in the high country area, and, and that's how I would qualify this, because the other thing that would happen with somebody like the Forest Service is they're dealing with such a big area, you cannot make a globalization about such a big area. So they get confused by the minutia that prevents them from saying things like this, like this beetle works great and it ought to be the first thing that gets used. So you've got Grandfather Golf and Country Club. A couple of years ago, they changed their, this what used to be their old logo. Look at their new logo, it's a hemlock. So you got the one percenters, woke up. Here's what I do when I'm at Grandfather and those guys are around, if one of, those, one of their members walks by me, I just go, thank you. And all of a sudden they'll turn and they'll look at me and go, why, why are you saying thank you? And I said, because your membership saved the hemlocks in the high country. Do you, I didn't know that. And then I said, like, well, come here and look at this, you know, and then bang, and here's a beetle. Oh, well, I need to go tell so-and-so about this. So if we can take, if you think about it, 
If we can take these people that have money and they have a social conscience, look at what they can do. Right? That's what I would say. So there you go. Now, okay, let, let's walk through this. Let me show you this real quick. Let's go through this real quick. So here's, here's how we collect them. So what I do normally, I use pint ice cream cartons. And depending on where I am, I can either use material. If this one's going into the lab, then I'll use material. If I'm collecting in North Carolina and it's going out in North Carolina, I can use this. If I'm shipping to another state, they don't want me to ship living material. So then what I do is I'll go to Excelsior and I'll put a couple wet filter papers in there. Okay, so here I've got a guide sheet with all this in here. This is all the collecting stuff that you need. You know, it's a little more than you actually need, but you've got this, you've got your recording stuff, you've got flagging, this is an umbrella to beat with, hat, your cooler, th thumb counters, and aspirator. Okay, so here's Pete Gurdon. This is the very first time that Pete started to beat a tree. And the thing that I noticed right away with the people that are really good with this, and this is actually on the guide sheet, this picture, because I start looking at Pete, and I said, Pete, you have beetles all over you, are a Laracobius magnet, just like me. So here's what happens. You pound on these trees, you're going to get all this debris, you get some, you know, this is at, this is at Big Western Hemlock, at, this is at Green Lake in Seattle. So you get all this debris, but you've got all these little, there's beetles all over the place, there's little beetles everywhere. So we just take an aspirator, suck those up with a thumb counter. Okay, so if you look close, there's your beetle. You'll have some other, that's a little uh, wasp that's probably attacking the pupae of something. It doesn't, doesn't bother our stuff, but it's, it's in there. Could be even just feeding on honeydew off the aphids. So anyway, that's what we're after. The other thing with this guy, if they get close to these needles, they'll grab the needle and hide under. Here is an aspirator. It's kind of hard to see from the reflection, but there's 106 beetles in here. I think I dumped it into a, into a, let's see if I, yeah, that's what 106 beetles looks like. You know, some people will look at those things and go, are you sure? And I'm like, there, there they are. Is yeah. it easy to confuse them with anything else when you're collecting, or is it pretty yeah. obvious? If it's a beetle, it's probably it. And it's winter active. Richard taught me how to find them in about five minutes. Yeah. yeah. And two years later, I went to check where I'd released them, and I found one the first tree I hit. You know? And that I knew what it was right away. Yeah, I hadn't looked at one up, for two years. That was a mountain air. I remember that. This is back when I, really, when I started. I knew I needed pint cartons, and I didn't have any. So I would go and get those cup of noodles, and they work great. You dump the noodles out, put the beetles in, put the thing back together. And then, of course, I would, I would cross out whatever flavor it was and put Laracobius flavor, all right? And so here's, I might have even brought, well, it doesn't matter, yeah. Uh, so what I would do, I'd get those, I'd, get, I'd buy foil, those rolls of insulation foil from Lowe's, get a box, make the foil to outline to fit the box. I'd have blue ices and newspapers because I'm going to overnight these things. You have to lie. You cannot tell them that you're overnighting live beetles. So they're going to come like this. In, you know, here's your cup. I might have had some Excelsior on this one and just to lay them out. But there's beetles on here. I mean, it's pretty simple. You just lay them out on a limb. <laughs>